Prison Writings My Life is My Sundance by Leonard Peltier Chapter 4 The death of loved ones is harder to take than your own. Your own death is easy by comparison. When I wasn't allowed to attend my father's funeral in 1989, I suffered pain worse than any physical pain. Pain without hope of closure. A wound eternally unhealed. He'd seen his son falsely imprisoned for 14 years, and it broke his heart. He'd served in World War II, getting machine-gunned in the legs for his effort. His brother, my Uncle Ernie, was killed in battle. You'd think the government he'd risked his life to defend might at least allow his son to attend his funeral. But no way. Vengeance runs deep. And there have been so many other deaths of close ones and supporters just these past few years. The death of Hazel Littlehawk, my spiritual mother who was friend to so many for so many years. Uncle Louis Irwin, a warrior with a heart as strong as a bear's, who inspired me every day and helped me to survive this nightmare place as my friend, supporter, and advisor. My selfless legal counselor and friend, Lou Gerwitz, and all too many others. I think of all those who have died violently along the same red road I've walked. Joe Kilsdright Stunts, killed by an unknown assailant's bullet at Oglala. Dallas Thundershield, shot down during our escape attempt from Lompoc, which I'll deal with later on. And Barbie Garcia, our fellow escapee, found unaccountably dead in his cell a couple of years later. There was Anna Mae Aquash, my wonderful Micmac sister in AIM, scheduled to be a defense witness in my Fargo trial, who was murdered in South Dakota for being innocent and being Indian, her hands cut off by a vengeful FBI and sent to Washington for identification when they knew very well who she was. That was a desecration, deliberate and calculated, an assault on our deepest and most intimate spiritual beliefs intended to intimidate us at the very core of our being. When the feds threatened another poor Indian woman, Myrtle Poor Bear, that they would do the same thing to her and her child if she didn't testify falsely against me, she so testified. Later she recanted the story prosecutors had fabricated for her, though it had already done me in. Now her, I can understand, and even perhaps forgive. But those who for a few pieces of U.S. silver or for whatever misguided motives inflicted this evil on this poor woman, and on me, and on all of us, including the American people themselves? I often wonder what fitful dreams come to them at night, if they truly believe in their Christian God, and the eternal, sizzling hell that surely lies waiting for them. But, no, there I go, being vindictive and vengeful myself wishing harm on others as they have wished it on me. I have to watch that in myself. I have to step on the head of that snake every time it rises. There's always someone to hate. The list of those who have earned our hatred and spurned our hatred is endless. Shall we draw up lists of each other's crimes? Must we hate each other for all time? I know I have often spoken out against Indian people who, it seemed to us, stood with the oppressors, turning against their own people, but I know that's an oversimplification. Indians have no easy choices. I see now that the U.S. Secret Service, nonetheless, is advertising for recruits in Indian newspaper. Imagine that! I know, too, that there are good-hearted Native people in the FBI, Devoted, dedicated, loyal, good Americans as they are good Indians. They've made that choice, and though I may not agree with it, I do respect it. I know the strain upon their hearts. It's good you're there, my brothers and sisters. So they can see us for what we are. Human beings, yes, ordinary and extraordinary human beings just the same as all other human beings on this earth. Yes, even we prisoners are human. I suppose every man proclaims himself innocent whether innocent or not. But I tell you, even the guilty are human. 
And as for the innocent who are banded as guilty, theirs is a special agony beyond all comprehension. Somehow, Wakantanka, Tunkashila, the great mystery, finds sense and meaning in all of this. Do the stars have a meaning? Then my life has a meaning. No doubt my name will soon be among the list of our Indian dead. At least I will have good company. For no finer, kinder, braver, wiser, worthier men and women have ever walked this earth than those who have already died for being Indian. Our dead keep coming at us. A long, long line of dead, ever-growing and never-ending. To list all of their names would be impossible. For the great, great majority of us have died unknown, unacknowledged. Yes, even our dead have been stolen from us, uprooted from our memory, just as the bones of our honored ancestors have been dishonored by being dug up from their graves and shipped to museums to be boxed and cataloged and hidden away in file drawers, denied the final request and right of every human being, a decent burial in Mother Earth and proper ceremonies of remembrance to light the way to the afterworld. Yes, the roll call of our Indian dead needs to be cried out, to be shouted from every hilltop in order to shatter the terrible silence that tries to erase the fact that we ever existed. I would like to see a red stone wall, like the black stone wall of the Vietnam War Memorial, which I've only seen in pictures. Yes, right there on the mall in Washington, D.C. And on that red stone wall, pigmented with the living blood of our people, and I would happily be the first to donate that blood, would be the names of all the Indians who ever died for being Indian. It would be hundreds of times larger than the Vietnam Memorial, which celebrates the deaths of fewer than 60,000 brave lost souls. The number of our brave lost souls reaches into the many millions, and every one of them remains unquiet until this day. Just as effective might be a Holocaust museum to the American Indian to recall the voices of those who were slaughtered. Yes, the voices of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, of Buddy Lamont and Frank Clearwater, of Joe Stunts and Dallas Thundershield, of Wesley Badheart Bull and Raymond Yellow Thunder, of Bobby Garcia and Anna Mae Aquash, and so, so many others. Their stilled voices cry out at us and demand to be heard. My life is a prayer for my people. Chapter 5 I've been treated no worse than many other prisoners. Better than some. At least I'm alive. Recently, for some unexplained reason, they confiscated the ceremonial skirt towel that I've used for years in our sacred sweat lodge. They tell me it's been thrown away. That hurt more than the physical deprivations and the bouts of solitary confinement. The beatings by and large have stopped, I hope. I've been beaten in the past for the high crime of passing half a sandwich to another inmate. I'd have eaten it myself, but my jaw was too swollen. So instead of seeing it thrown away, I gave it to another guy who was hungry. That got me two bruised ribs and an even sore jaw than usual. And my headaches were even worse for a while from a bang my head took against the corner of a door frame. I have terrible headaches much of the time. I lost 80% of the vision in my left eye from a retinal hemorrhage I suffered years ago. I'm also told I've tested positive for hepatitis B. I've been forced to work in the prison furniture factory despite my chronic ill health. My mouth is a horror show. As a kid, I had lockjaw, and my bite and gums have never been right since. I also had a break in my jaw that never healed correctly. My jaw is swollen and gives me constant pain. I've had three unsuccessful surgeries in prison facilities in recent years. The doctors at the Springfield, Missouri Federal Prisoners Medical Facility where I was treated could not agree on a treatment for my jaw. 
One wanted to put a drainage tube on the outside of my mouth. The other, a drainage tube on the inside. Each said the other didn't know what he was talking about. In one operation, they put plastic joints in my jaw, and then one of the joints came loose and fell out. And for weeks, I had loose wires sticking out of my jaw on the inside, scraping my tongue and gums and inner cheek raw. Though my jaw remained and still remains locked almost completely shut, with only a narrow slit between my teeth through which soft mashed food can be pushed, I've been refused special food. Eight applesauce, it's good for you, I was told by one guard with a sneering smile. Throughout most of my stays at Springfield, I was held not in the hospital, but in a segregated punishment cell, crawling with ants, lice, and cockroaches. At the last operation, I lost so much blood that repeated transfusions were required. I can tell you, I passed to the other world during that time. I was sure I had died, and I was glad it was finally over. I was looking forward to joining all those friends and relatives who had passed to the sky world before me. And then, I was suddenly back in my filthy cell at Springfield. For some reason, I was also given prolonged radiation treatments, though I've been told by outside doctors that there is absolutely no reason to use radiation in cases like mine. I've refused further prison surgery and requested immediate medical treatment by an independent specialist. That request is still being denied. Some of my supporters worried I was being deliberately bled or radiated to death by vengeful authorities. I think not. Death would have been bliss compared to that, in any case, and they certainly don't want me to know bliss of any kind. When the pain screaming in my jaw gets too bad, I just close my eyes and think of Sundance. That helps. My body may be locked in here, but my spirit flies with the eagle. The heart of the world. Here I am, locked in my own shadow for more than 20 years, and yet I have reached my hand through the stone and steel and razor wire and touched the heart of the world. Mitakyowasen, my Lakota brethren say. We are all related. We are one. In the shadowed night. Sometimes, in the shadowed night, I become spirit. The walls, the bars, the gratings dissolve into light, and I unloose my soul and fly through the inner darkness of my being. I become transparent, a bright shadow, a bird of dreams singing from the tree of life. Chapter 6 You never get used to prison life. In my sleep, I hear people's voices, some of them long dead. Like my father. Such voices are torture. To wonder every day, every hour, whether or not you will ever be free again is a very special form of torture. It takes its daily, hourly toll on your heart and in your soul particularly when you have to explain to your grandson why they won't let you out to attend his soccer game. It eats you up inside to hear his little boy's voice ask, Grandpa, why don't you just finish your sentence? He thought my sentence was just a whole lot of words I had to write, like copying a sentence over and over for a punishment assignment at his grade school. He couldn't understand that my sentence continues for twice my natural life. When, on their occasional visits in here, I hold my grandchildren in my arms and smell the scent of their hair and feel the warmth of their little hands in my own, I am momentarily transported. But then comes the inevitable clang of metal doors sliding shut behind them as they leave, and I am transported instantly back here to this eternal iron lodge called Lavenworth. 
That metallic clanging echoes in my soul as it reverberates down the cold walled corridors. In all honesty, I can tell you that I wish I hadn't been at the Jumping Bull camp that day in 1975. But I've never regretted that I was one of those who stood up and helped to protect my people. I've sacrificed nearly a quarter century of my life, of my freedom, for so standing up. I admit it. I'm tired. Over the years, I've hidden away my suffering. I smile when I feel like crying. I laugh when I feel like dying. I have to stare at pictures of my children and grandchildren to see them grow up. I miss the simplest things of ordinary life. Having dinner with friends. Taking walks in the woods. I miss gardening. I miss children's laughter. I miss dogs barking. I miss the feel of rain on my face. I miss babies. I miss the sound of birds singing and of women laughing. I miss winter and summer and spring and fall. Yes, I miss my freedom. So would you. One of our great Lakota spiritual elders, the late Matthew King, said, Only one thing sadder than remembering you once were free, and that's forgetting you once were free. That would be the saddest thing of all. That's something I, Leonard Peltier, will never do. I will never forget the taste of freedom, nor will I forget the sight of the sunrise or the sunset. One day, I hope to see those again. One morning you wake up and you find you've been given something you didn't want. Two life sentences plus seven years. These gray-green steel gratings, these cold cement walls, these endless coils of razor wire, these sliding steel doors that take you from nowhere to nowhere, these shadowed and inhuman corridors are now your world. This place is yours, they tell you, until the year 2041. Not one lifetime sentence, but two, consecutive. That, plus seven years, of course. That's for once in 1978, having tried to escape to avoid being assassinated, which I'll cover later. I tell myself, be thankful you didn't get three lifetime sentences, Leonard. After all, you could have not killed three people instead of not killing two. They'd have really thrown the book at you then. Yes, Leonard. Consider two lifetimes plus seven years very, very lenient for the high crime of being innocent. There's no telling how long I'll actually be here. Once I counted in days. Then weeks. Then months. Then years. Now, I count in decades. I've already done two decades. Must I do two more? Three? Four? Seems the arithmetic gets easier as the time gets harder. You can have mad thoughts in here. Like, tell me, when I die, do they bring my corpse back to my cell to serve out the full term of my second sentence plus those seven years? Perhaps I've already been brought back and have just forgotten it. Maybe I'm already a corpse. A breathing cadaver. But no. No. A cadaver couldn't smile at himself this way. Somewhere, somehow, there's got to be something funny about all of this. Something horrendously funny. A wild cosmic joke on me. A real knee slapper in some demonic heaven or hell. A while back, someone was crying out eerily down the corridor in the echoing half-darkness. Slur the buds, he cried out dementedly, repeating those meaningless words over and over again in a ghostly voice, softly hissing in a hollow. Slur the buds! Slur the buds! That's all I could make out. He must have called it out in that soft, hollow hiss a dozen times in the course of fifteen minutes. Still other voices picked it up, 
and for a short while there was an impromptu ghostly chorus of slur the buds echoing down these unholy corridors i never learned what the words meant i never learned who it was who called out maybe i dreamed it maybe that was just me myself calling out in the demented darkness of my own imagination Doing time does this thing to you, but of course you don't do time. You do without it, or rather, time does you. Time is a cannibal that devours the flesh of your years day by day, bite by bite. And as he finishes the last morsel with the juices of your life running down his bloody chin, he smiles wickedly, belches with satisfaction, and hisses out in ghostly tones, Slur the buds. The Knife of My Mind I have no present. I have only a past and, perhaps, a future. The present has been taken from me. I'm left in an empty space whose darkness I carve at with the knife of my mind. I must carve myself anew out of the razor wire nothingness. I will know the ecstasy and the pain of freedom. I will be ordinary again. Yes, ordinary. That terrifying condition where all is possibility, where the present exists and must be faced. Chapter 7 on a window sill beyond the bars, a pigeon stands on pink feet, chest fluffed out, preening in the morning sun. Some paint has peeled off the painted over window, and pressing my forehead right up against the cold glass, I peek out at him sitting there, a universe away. The pigeon doesn't see me staring at him. His feathers have a subtle iridescence to them. The hand of my mind reaches out, and touches him through the bars and thick security glass. A spirit touch. He doesn't seem to notice. He pecks his small, sharp beak into those iridescent chest feathers and ignores me. I marvel at the miracle of him, standing there, so near yet far, unfettered as the wind. The whole sky is his, and yet... From all that infinite space, he picks this bleak prison windowsill to pause upon this winter morning, blessing me with his sudden unexpected presence, his astonishing reality. To me, the jailbird, this pigeon is as holy a messenger as an eagle. He tells me of the sky world beyond this steel and cement and razor wire. Once, when we came out of the prison sweat lodge, we looked up and saw two eagles circling high above us. They came to bless us, sent by Sky Father. So am I known to the eagle and the pigeon, holy messengers both. Sky Father hasn't forgotten me. He sends his winged children to comfort me, and I send skyward through the bars a winged prayer of thanks. No prison bars can stop a prayer. Chapter 8 Many nights I lie here in my bunk and let my mind, my dreams, flow free, conjuring up a future I might never see. Certainly I pray my long journey doesn't end behind prison bars. I know it will not. My Cree brethren in Canada say they've set aside a parcel of land for me where I can raise a small herd of sacred buffalo. I dream of that often. But then I think to myself, Leonard, that's just selfishness. To go off and live the good life and forget the struggle. Yes, of course I have some living to catch up on when I get out of here, but my life will still be my people's. When at last I'm a free man again, the real work will begin. Our most important work, before all else, is our survival as a people. This means we must work unceasingly, no matter what the odds, for the honoring of the treaties. 
we must never lose sight of that. I fear that Indian people will lose what culture we have left, that we will lose our land base, that those who would drive us off our territories into non-existence will succeed. Our vigilance and our total determination in this regard must never let up. No, not ever. But within that greater struggle, we must turn and help ourselves and our people one by one. There's not a one of us who can't give a helping hand, just as there's not a one of us who can't benefit from a helping hand. We must reach out helping hands to each other. Prison hasn't prevented me from helping people. I organize clothing, food, and toy drives year-round. I support women's shelters and Head Start programs. I have established a scholarship for Native law students at New York University and also helped to fund a newspaper by and for Indian children. I'm a foster parent to two young boys in Guatemala and El Salvador. I've been working on ways to improve the healthcare system on the Rosebud Reservation and recently have become involved in economic reform for Pine Ridge. I've just recently sponsored a drive in conjunction with Food Not Bombs to buy rice, beans, sugar, and other staples for our struggling Indian brothers and sisters now fighting for their very existence, their very identity as Indian people down in Chiapas, Mexico. I work closely with the Leonard Peltier Charitable Foundation, developed to helping underprivileged Indian children. I'm also deeply involved in winning Native religious rights here in prison, a continuous battle. Still, I'm limited in what I can do within these walls. My dream is to rejoin the people and build Native American community centers offering after-school activities and counseling. I want to work with specialists from around the world to help prevent and treat alcoholism. I want to help create jobs and job training for Indian people. It's so frustrating to hear over and over again about teen suicide, drug abuse, unemployment, and seemingly eternal poverty among my people. I ask myself, what has my sacrifice been for? And yet I know when this sacrifice ends, a new sacrifice begins. There's always another Sundance. I am everyone. I am everyone who ever died without a voice or a prayer or a hope or a chance. Everyone who ever suffered for being Indian, for being human, for being indigenous, for being free, for being other, for being committed. I am every one of them. Every single one. Yes, even you. I am everyone.